April 2006. He sat against the earthen wall, hungry and exhausted with his knees pulled up in front of him, as if they could somehow shield him from what was coming. The wall was cool and damp behind him. It made him ache, the cold seeping into his bones, the way water freezes inside rocks and cracks them apart. Night sounds, wind in pines, the peep and rasping of insects, subdued human voices, fires popping. From higher up the mountain came the clack and heavy rumble of a rock fall. He was alert by now to any sound that might promise deliverance, but the slide had probably just been set off by gravity or by one of the myriad little templars that rattled the mountains. He drifted in and out of sleep. Dream images seemed to appear on the hut's dark walls. He was back in California, walking with his daughter in sunlight. They passed under a tree and leaf shadows danced across her face. She smiled at him and asked a question, but she spoke in a language he didn't understand. He tried to make out her words. She grew frustrated then and finally strode on without him. When he tried to follow, he found that he had taken root there. He watched her walk away for what seemed hours until she was lost, a speck on the smudged horizon. Peter said a voice, try to stay awake. It was Devi. We don't have much time. He dreaded sleep and he desired it more than anything. Right, he whispered. Even more than sleep, he wanted water. As the dream receded, he saw a reflected firelight playing on the wall and he could just make out Devi's silhouette and shattered face. Alex, his daughter, lay curled on their side, asleep, her head in Debbie's lap. Her skin was covered with grime. He and Debbie had decided to wait to awaken her as close to the end as possible. Debbie's eyes gleamed in the darkness. She sat cross-legged, her right hand on Alex's shoulder, her left on her own knee. She was strong, formidable, even in stillness, her face serene. She was only a year older than Alex, but the troubles of her life had tempered her to a degree that was becoming fully evident only now when others would have broken and she did not. Ten or twelve people crouched or lay in the hut, people who had been here far longer. There was quiet moaning, though it was impossible to tell if it came from those who slept or those who were awake, whether it was due to hunger or cold or thirst or dysentery, or indeed some combination of all these to the general deprivation and depravity of the place. Teenagers with rifles loitered outside, smoking and laughing. The hut reeked from unwashed bodies and from the plastic five-gallon bucket in the corner that served as a latrine. During the day, a cloud of flies hovered over it and there was, of course, no toilet paper. Everyone's clothes stank of shit. Peter had averted his eyes a couple of hours earlier as Alex squatted miserably over the bucket, emptied by diarrhea until her bones seemed to grow through her gleaming skin. She finally crawled back, but to Devi, not to him. She would be 18 in three weeks, would have been 18, that is, if things had not gone so quickly and catastrophically. Civilization's comforts had turned out to be a thin crust of ice over deep, cold waters, and it had taken only a couple of days to reduce the three of them from their comfortable life in Kathmandu to this. Soon they would have to clump together to hold off the cold. The camp sat in a valley at 12,000 feet, choked with rhododendrons and mist. Someone lit a kerosene lantern outside, and its yellow glare pressed into the hut, filtered into tiny specks by the tattered burlap hanging in the doorway. An avalanche of cool air gathered at the head of the valley and began to roll down, stirring the trees. Peter heard it for 15 or 20 seconds before it finally blew into camp, flapping canvas and filling the air with dust. The lantern swayed, splashing light around drunkenly. Somewhere a piece of corrugated tin made a woofing noise and a dog barked back. The door curtain billowed in and outside 
stood a short, skinny kid with a Kalashnikov half as tall as he was. He glanced in at them, indignant that he had to be there at all, barefoot in the night. His eyes had the contemptuous glare of most of these soldiers, kids who had been forced from their families by hunger and fear, who couldn't afford the softnesses of childhood. After a few minutes, the wind died as fast as it had started. Outside, a boombox came on, playing American heavy metal. Peter cursed himself, remembering his conversation with the Commandant. He'd been outflanked without even realizing it. Now he was trembling as much from fear as from cold. He wished he could believe in something comforting, but he was long past trying to convince himself. Anyway, when they came for them, what difference would it make? So what if he wept, begging as he half expected to do? A couple of minutes later, it would all be the same. Someone shouted outside. Peter pulled himself further into wakefulness and looked around. Debbie hadn't moved. Alex breathed softly. He'd missed the leech inside his boot. He was sure of it now, but he was too exhausted to go rooting after it. Scratching at the bites just made them bleed anyway. In one way, the feeling of relinquishment was a relief, as if he'd been pulling an ox cart his whole life and had just walked over a cliff into free fall. He didn't know how to reconcile this feeling with all the others, with the dread, with the regret and the guilt about his daughter and Devi. His mind seemed to be fracturing into prisms like a piece of quartz struck with a hammer. Each piece refracted the world differently and cohesion had become impossible. Was this really new or had he just failed to realize it until desperation and despair made it plain? There was argument inside his head, even a kind of war, as if the violence outside had finally kicked down the doors and stormed in, knocking everything askew. He'd hold out hope until the very end, he couldn't help it, and even though he probably wouldn't pray, he wasn't above a little bargaining. If he took a man to be made in God's image, this made more sense anyway. Mercy was in short supply, but commerce was common as dirt and understood by everyone. He formed the offer in his mind and sent it out. Kill me then. I'm all I have to trade. But let Alex live. She's worked hard and she's young and she deserves to see something come of it. As if this thought had somehow penetrated her sleeping mind, Alex stirred and murmured. Dad, she said. Here, his voice a dry rag and the wind caught on some nail. She crawled toward him. He met her halfway and helped her to his little section of wall. She draped herself across his lap, facing out toward the doorway, and he stroked her hair. He'd always done this when she was a child. She whispered, her throat parched. Will anyone find out what happened to us? He knew what she meant by this. She meant her mother. He doubted anybody would ever know. He wasn't sure Cheryl would care anyway, at least about him. But there was no reason to point this out. It might be better if she didn't, he said. Alex lifted a hand, then touched her fingertips to the packed earth as if testing its solidity. I guess so. She adjusted her position. Her ribs pressed on Peter's thigh, and his foot was going to sleep. He wanted her to be comfortable, so he held still. He wouldn't be needing the foot anyway once the sun rose. Beneath the odors of sweat and shit, Alex smelled the way she always had. The scent was like a small, shy creature, something he loved since she was a baby and that hadn't changed as she grew. She'd been a beautiful child, and then as a young woman, slender and smart and athletic, her hair the color of wheat and her blue-green eyes as melancholy as the late autumn sky. The ordeal of the past day, the long march at altitude with almost no food, the bad water, and now the diarrhea, had utterly drained her strength, though, and her mind was blurring toward a forgetting that might have been more frightening had it not also been merciful. I want to sleep some more, she mumbled. I hope they won't take us too early. He stroked her hair. What world was she inhabiting? Was she delirious? She was hot with fever. 
In any case, it would be cruel to remind her, sleep as long as you like, he said. Her breathing evened out and slowed. She curled tighter around him as the night grew chillier. A little while later, he could see that Debbie was still sitting up. Are you cold, he asked. Do you want to come over? I'm all right, she replied. Thanks. He felt relieved at the final word. He didn't want her to die, hating him, another thing that didn't matter, of course, but in some way it did. I'm sorry, he said again, quietly. Debbie exhaled. You did your best. You just misjudged. He lay back against the wall, shivering. What could you do with six hours? Nothing but wait. Off in the distance, someone rang a bell, and from all around the village, dogs began to howl. <laughs>